So welcome to our STEM series, the STEM series number 11. Um, we are here joined with us with uh, Ms. Heidi Love with uh, New Mexico Tech, Emmer Tech. Um, and she'll go a little bit more into detail about her role and what she does as a facility, but um, would like to welcome you all to the series. Some general housekeeping rules throughout the session are, um, please keep your microphone on mute when the session is going, um, just any background noise, but if you do have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question, you know, when appropriate. Um, also, please feel free to utilize the chat. So if you're not sure where that is, it's at the bottom of your screen. There's like a little text bubble looking thing. Um, and so it works just like a text message. Um, and also Heidi, when your session is going on, we'll be helping you to monitor the chat because when you're sharing your screen, the chat like pops up really in a weird place. So we'll help you monitor the chat with any questions. Um, but again, please, please feel free to ask questions as, as we go along through the session for our students on the line um, to receive credit for attending the session. Um, I will put in a chat as we get close to the end of the session. Um, it's a survey monkey. It gives us an additional link to just complete a quick attendance survey. So um, just make sure you complete that before you leave to get your credit for participation. Um, than that, um, I will now turn it over and I will keep my camera off and my microphone off just so that it doesn't pick me up on the recording as the host of the show. But I'll, I'm here. <laughs> so if you need anything, and I'll also be turning in with any questions and monitoring the chat um, until your presentation is done with. Wonderful. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to come talk with everyone. Um, normally in the past, I've gotten to host the school school groups that come through and it this will be the first time I've done this in a year and so I'm really happy to be able to do this again so let me get this shared there we go okay so everyone can see the the PowerPoint right now okay uh, like I said, my name is Heidi Love. Uh, I am a research engineer here at Emertech. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit of what it is we do here and then uh, go through what it is that I do here and show you some of the stuff that I think is really neat. I like this job a lot. So we are the uh, Energetic Materials Research Testing Center. So anything that's energetic, um, explosives, uh, gunpowder, fireworks, anything that has that kind of energy, we research it. That's okay. We are a division of New Mexico Tech. Um, if you live here in town, if you live in Socorro, you see, you hear booms all the time. And you just, like you hear thunder. And during the day, totally clear sky. And it's all the explosions that we're doing on the, our field lab. Um, we started over 70 years ago. Um, a Dr. Workman at UNM wanted to do some testing of a device that could help stop kamikaze pilots coming in. And they needed a big area, didn't have it in Albuquerque, but we had it down here. We have um, a very large, Field test. This is the view of M Mountain from, if you can see my pointer there, that's M Mountain. That's the view from New Mexico Tech campus. And on here, ah, it went back. That, that big M is this little tiny area here. New Mexico Tech campus is the green area. The rest of this map is our field lab. We've got 40 square miles, 30 test sites. So if you see any of the little, all the little white lines, the roads, those are all places that we set up a test and it's far enough away from everyone, nothing else going on out here. Um, we, this makes this the largest campus in America. Even though New Mexico Tech is a very small university, um, this is owned by New Mexico Tech, so it's the largest campus. Um, we have, we share the land with cattle, 
bighorn sheep, elk, deer, coyotes. Going out to a field, going out to one of the tests, um, we'll just run into 18 elk that are just crossing the street. Um, and it's a big priority for us that what we do does not hurt them. And that's part of our setup when we do our test is we have to make sure that we're not hurting the wildlife, we're not hurting the environment. This is just a small list of the things that we do. We do computer simulations, we do gun experiments, we'll do uh, explosive formulation development, helping to develop new explosives. Most of the research isn't done from us. Um, what will happen is a company or a professor, someone that wants to test something, they have an idea and they need to blow it up somewhere. Um, uh, if a company has developed what they think is a much better blast armor to help keep people safe, they need to blow it up. So they'll call us up and say they want to run a test. We'll help them design it. We'll help them figure out what they need. They'll come out and we'll do that here on in our field lab. Um, we also have professors here at New Mexico Tech that are developing new explosives. They're developing uh, ways to measure explosives and they'll come out here and test that. It's a lot of fun. Um, so this is one of our largest explosives that we've ever done. It was 20,000 pounds. And we had to notify the town or we had to let people know this was gonna happen. It was really big. Um, and you can see just how much of an area that we have to test in. So that's the biggest. Some of the smallest things we've done, and we still do this, you can weld different types of metal together with explosives. And especially metals that don't weld together nicely, like titanium, doesn't weld well. Doesn't weld well. And you can see on the picture that little wavy area um, between the aluminum and the copper, the explosive, the shockwave went through it and kind of opened it up and let it lock back down together. And so we can do the really, really huge and we can do the really, really tiny. Um, I think the explosive welding is neat because you can weld, we've got three, three different metals welded together. You can't really see it very well, but um, so we have tons of different things we get to do here. Um, one of the major things we do is we do work with counterterrorism. Um, it started in 1987 is when our work on counterterrorism really started. Um, it's, we try to develop the, or determine the effectiveness of terrorist weapons and improvised weapons, improvised explosives. Um, we have several sites that are dedicated just to testing structural components. So this is a three-story building that we have built here. And it's just like a skeleton of a building and we'll cover the outside of it with whatever the building manufacturers wanna test. They wanna see if stronger glass would be better, or if for this it was metal walls would be better, what happens? And we blow it up for them. And that was a lot of fun. Um, this is an IED, like they have, like they use in um, um, Iraq and, and Afghanistan. This is only one pound of C4 in the vehicle. So a little bit can do a lot of damage. One of the other things that we do is we train first responders to what does it look like when a car bomb goes off? What do you look for afterwards? What was the car and what was the bomb? When it's all a destroyed piece of metal, which was which? So we do a lot of training with that. Um, it's, it's important to us that we help not only help science, but help keep people safe. Um, 
let's see, this is a video of a little tiny bit of C4 packed into a cylinder. And it's one of the ways they use to measure an explosive's effectiveness. If you've got a new explosive, you're not too sure how it compares with others. You can't really set it off and just take its temperature. There's a, a way to measure it. And that is by putting it in a standardized copper tube and seeing how long it takes for it to blow up. So when someone's developing a new explosive, we help them test it. We also do uh, various ballistics testing. This is a shadow, it's called a Schlieren photography where you get in the, you get the pressure wave. But this one is neat because it is hitting that water droplet right there. And it turns out that when it hits the water droplet, it actually changes the direction of the bullet. So it really does matter if you're shooting in the rain. People have theorized it, we got to show it, that it matters. Not by terribly much, but it matters. We also have a sled track. So the first video is this rocket going into, the next video is it coming out the other side of this great big huge concrete barrier. So they'll put like a rocket on a, on a rail track and shoot it straight down and see how it goes. See how far in can go. This is another, it's that same three-story building that we have, but we've covered it with different glass this time. They wanted to develop a better way to keep people safe inside when a bomb goes off on the outside. So this was the first one that they put together, which is what's normally, what was previously normally built. And lots of damage, not so good. So then they came up with this new idea that, okay, what if they built it so that the first layer of glass gets destroyed, but if there's a layer behind it, would, would that make it better? Would that make it worse? So we put it back together again. We put their new windows on it. And what I always love about this one is you can see that explosion go off and then that pressure wave come through. And you see that hitting as it hits the, the building. So they had these ideas, they tested them. And this is that same explosion, but from the inside of the building where we've got cameras, high speed cameras set up. So you can see that pressure wave coming again. And there's always this tension of when it's gonna hit, it's great. So for this one, the really amazing thing, you can see the camera kind of falling back through the, the case. The outer glass gets destroyed, but the people on the inside would still be safe. So that was a really big development to be able to have the explosion hit and not turn the pressure higher inside and to, one of the things is the, the glass is one of the most dangerous things. So it's not sending those glass fragments into the building. The Goldman Sachs building in New York, when they were rebuilding after 9-11, they used the research that we did here to make those buildings safer and stronger. So we're really, we're proud of that. We also do, we've got this little, we call this urban canyon. It's a one third scale city block. And all of these little Lego blocks, we can move them around, we can put them in different configurations um, because there were theories about how blast waves would go around and computer models. Um, but it turns out they weren't all that good. Uh, there was a competition 
that uh, remember if it's the UN or the US government put out. Um, various countries submitted their computer models. So everyone submitted a computer model of what they thought the blast wave would do as it goes around this city area. Um, all the computer models predicted way lower pressures than what we actually saw, much lower pressures. So all of these little dots that are, you can see in the blocks, those are all instrumentation holes. So we can build a one third scale city, set off explos explosions in different areas and measure how the pressure travels through. And we get so much information from that. This is that same explosion, but from the top. And you can kind of see how that pressure wave doesn't just blast through, it, it bounces and echoes and sometimes it adds and sometimes it subtracts. And it's really complicated. Uh, so it's been extremely useful to be able to model it on the computer and then go out and see what it does in real life. Uh, this was another idea that was had you know, the rhino lining in, in like truck beds and stuff. They wanted to see if we if we took a cinder block wall and put rhino lining painted all around it, would that make it blast proof? And so we made a cinder block building. We painted it with the rhino lining. We set off the explosions and the wall is still standing, but it turns out that Underneath that lining, the cinder block is uh, powder. So it's a very unsafe building now. Even though the walls didn't collapse, it's they're pulverized on the inside. So it turns out that it's not a good idea. Um, we also, in, in addition to explosions, we do ballistics testing, uh, which means guns, um, shooting projectiles, at whatever speed they want. Um, we'll have a group that needs a projectile to be hit at 3,000 feet per second. So we'll make that happen. We design the suppose, we figure out how much gunpowder to use, how much charge to use. We figure out the aerodynamics of it, and then we take instrumentation on all of us. We've got pressure gauges and cameras, and we'll take the velocities. It all depends on what they need. This is an, called an arena test. What I like about this is all of these, the black, the black things are witness panels. So you see the explosion go off and you see all the bright sparkly bits. That's all the fragments going through. So what we do with that is we measure all of those witness panels. We measure how quickly they got fragmented, how many fragments, how big, all kinds of measurements just from this. So we'll get a lot of information from that. Um, we've also got, you can see this little guy up there, how big this shock tube is. Um, we were doing that to try to measure what a blast through a subway tunnel would be like. How can we make that more, less damaging? And all of this is on this huge 40 square mile field lab we have out here. This is another thing um, that we've done out here. This is a simulated asteroid. How hard can you hit an asteroid before it's broken apart? And how can we move it without breaking it apart so that it doesn't hit the Earth? And it turns out that asteroids have, uh, they're mostly made up of rocks that are clumped together. So they made this pretend asteroid and we hit it and we see what does it do? And we'll do this several times. We'll do it with less energy and less energy to see if how it changes. We also have specialized cameras that can track these projectiles as they're flying through, which when this, this is going so fast, so it's quite an accomplishment to be able to watch this. Um, next one, kind of going through these fast because it's just fun to watch videos of things exploding. I like it. 
this was a meteor impact simulation that uh, the National Geographic Channel wanted to do. So we buried some explosives and set it off like the earth getting impacted by a meteor. So that could be studied as how does the ejecta fall out? What does it look like? What kind of damage does it do? We have had Mythbusters out here. We've had National Geographic Channel out here. We've had the History Channel out here. Um, so many places because there's so much that they get to do. Um, this one is the Mythbusters destroying a car. They wanted to see what would happen when you hit a car. And that's the sled track. And the car just disappears. It just turns into this fine red mist. Um, that car was impacted at 500 miles per hour. Ah, whoops. So that poor car got hit at 500 miles an hour and it's just gone. Um, the explosion show came out and this is that same urban canyon where we the fake city. They wanted to blow up paint. So we we could we blew up paint. And I just thought it was so pretty. Normally we don't get a lot of pretty, but I thought this was fun. Um and that was the result of it. So part of what we do, like I said, I myself don't do the research. A company or a researcher will have an idea and they want to test it. They don't know all the details about exactly what they need to use. Um, for instance, uh, the JPL, the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they're, they have an idea for a balloon system that carries a seismometer, but it carries it in the atmosphere. And they wanna be able to see if it detects earthquakes the same as a seismometer on the earth would, or that's actually buried in the earth. Because they're hoping to be able to send this balloon system to Venus. So they need to simulate an earthquake. It's kind of hard to sit around and wait for an earthquake. So we go ahead and we bury 100 pounds of AMFO. But they don't know exactly what they want. They know that they want a certain amount of energy to happen. And they know they want it to happen every five seconds. They need three explosions every five seconds to simulate an earthquake. They don't know exactly how, what the right stuff to use. They don't know how to make that happen, but that's our job. So they come to us with an experiment idea of we need to have this much energy happen at this time. It becomes our job to figure out what are we going to use? Are we going to use C4? Are we going to use AMFO? Are we going to use some other mix? Are we going to use, um, do we need debt court to set it off or does it need better timing? What do we need to do? And then we also have to figure out how are we gonna get the information from it? Um, as you can see, we use lots of high-speed cameras. That's the only really way to see these explosions is to have these super high-speed cameras. Um, but we also take, um, we've got these little pressure gauges. Eh, there we go. Um, and that is just this little tiny dot here and it can measure extremely high pressures. So we'll put this, if there's like a wall, We'll have this sitting on one side of it and all the cabling coming out so that we can measure the pressure wave as it hits certain areas. We also use timing pins where there's like little, little tiny crystals. And as that crystal gets impacted, it produces an electrical charge, which then we record the time. So there's all kinds of information that we can get from these explosions. The explosions are fun. I like the explosions part. But the real important part is the data that we're collecting. How far did it make something move? How hard was that thing hit? How much damage did it 
receive? Uh, what was the acceleration? What was the velocity? So all of this is just in service of getting data. We're just using explosives to get the data. And then that is what we use to make um, decisions about what works better, what, what can be done better. Um, so I, 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 love, I love the explosions. It's so much fun. Um, some of the ways that you can trend, you can be able to do this kind of thing. Uh, engineering is a big one. If you can do any of the engineering, the mechanical, because we have to build so many new things. Um, you know, if if they want to study that, like that curtain wall, they want it, they know they want to study the glass, but how do they get it to stay and but not change the, the properties of it. So we're always designing new test stands and new holders and new ways that will, they can handle the extreme pressures and the extreme accelerations. Uh, so material, mechanical engineering are used all the time. Chemical engineering, that's what, ex, what energetics are. It's chemical reactions that go really, 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 really fast. And we also need electrical engineers because when we have 50, we've got 50 gauges coming out of a test wall, each one of those it has a cable on it. And now we're talking how much resistance, how far can we go away with that, that, that gauge before we need to add an amplifier? How much is causing um, interference in the line so that we're not actually getting the data, we're getting uh, a phase shift on the electricity. All of that is, you need to have electrical engineers out here for that. And we all kind of, we'll have teams where there's the, the research engineer that kind of comes up with the idea of how the experiment's gonna be done. Then we've got the instrumentation group and we tell them what data that we need. We need to be able to, we need five measurements of pressure and the pressure is going to be in the 10 pascal 10 gigapascal region they need to know how what kind of instruments that we're going to need to get that data and then we also have the field crew um they help they build the things that we need built uh welders and uh, machine shop the machine shop is invaluable. Uh, they know how to make something work just a little bit better or no, that's not quite the right material. Let's use this aluminum instead of that. Um, carpentry is a huge one because we're always building stands for things. We're building fake houses. We're building dummies that are there just to get fragments in them. And if the wood is not strong enough, then it looks like there was more damage than it really would do. And if the wood is too strong, then it, it looks like it's safe when it's not. And then the heavy equipment movers, the forklift operators, the crane operators, all of this, we all have to get together to make these experiments happen. And like I said, I, I love it. I love it a lot. And these are just some pictures of need explosions. There's even one of a little dummy up there. Um, so that is my quick, quick talk. Are there any questions? I can find the chat. I have a question. Um, do you have I know for the presentation we were watching, is there any, um, do you have any videos with the, the just to see like the, how, how loud some of these possibly may be? We don't. Okay. We really don't. It might be hard to collect, um, it might be hard to collect the sound <laughs> with the fancy camera. The, the funny thing is, is that um, it always is loud. Uh, hearing protection is a huge thing out here. Whenever the, any of the explosions go off, we're in a bunker. 
for that uh, big one for the house, the, the, the three-story building, I was in a bunker a mile away. So, and even then it feel the thump against the, the walls. Um, on the high-speed cameras, it would be so slow. It would just be this low brrr. Um, but it, it is loud, but it's always very, very quick because you see the, we're used to seeing explosions on movies and, and like this, where they don't ever show them just quick. They want them slow-mo because it, they, they look really cool in slow-mo. And so it's always this slow thing, but it's actually a very quick pop is what it always sounds like. Sounds like a very short thunderclap. And that's about it. Anything else? There are a couple of questions in the chat. Said, one is, did you want to blow things up when you were a kid or was it an acquired interest? Ah, that is a really good one. Um, it's a weird thing. Um, I am an oddball. I started in astronomy. The thing with the asteroids was mine. That was my fake asteroid. That was my master's work. And I realized that after I'd done that and I'd finished and the funding had run out and I was finished with my master's degree, I was having a hard think about, okay, well, what am I gonna do now? I mean, I've been working on smacking asteroids. There's not really a lot of work doing that here on earth. Um, so I had to think about like, okay, well, what do I wanna do now? And I really had fun trying to figure out how to make this fake asteroid how to make it work. They came to me with this idea of like, okay, here's two marbles, let's get them to stick together. Now make that bigger and make it like 500 marbles. And I really liked doing that. And I liked coming out to Emertech to have Emertech shoot it. And I was like, okay, so how can I do that more? And um, I was lucky enough to be looking when they were hiring. So, I actually never thought, this was not something I thought I was gonna do, but I just have enjoyed it. And then the next question is, how often do you get to set off these types of explosions and conduct experiments? Is it more paperwork than fieldwork? Ooh, there's always more paperwork than I like. It goes in spurts. It's really strange. You will spend three weeks doing nothing but paperwork, writing the test plan, because we have to start with, okay, this is gonna happen. We have to, we have to describe every single part of what's gonna happen. Um, this equipment will be set up here. This big barrier will be set here. This will be set there. Everything will be set up. This is the instrumentation we're gonna use. It's all gonna go into this, this recording device. Then it's gonna go, we have to describe all of that. So all of that paperwork happens. And then when that's done and the customer comes out, we can be out in the field for weeks, every day, every day for weeks, being out there doing this testing. Um, but honestly, we, we're usually doing so much that I'll start that test plan, that customer comes out, I'll, I'll work out with them in the mornings and then I'll come back to the office in the afternoon, do the paperwork for the next test that's coming, go back out in the morning for the previous. So I'm, there's always something going on. Um, I think some of the longest that we've had without having testing is a couple weeks. It's usually slow at Christmas. Um, come September, we're gonna be crazy. And I'll be doing, you know, two days of testing on this group here and then another three days on that. It, it can be daily. It hasn't been for me for right now because all of my projects have turned into paperwork this year, which is not fun. But, um, but yeah, it's, I would say normally three days a week we're out blowing stuff up. But we've got 12, 12 engineers here so if each one of those is doing three days a week, it, like I said, we'll have 
we'll have four or five test ranges all going at the same time. So you'll have blown you'll have explosions over here on this side of the mountain, you'll have explosions on that side of the mountain. So it's pretty constant. So then the next question, um, we actually have online with us also, we have um, um, Hillary, I don't, I, don't, actually, I don't know if you say your name, Pineda or Pineda from the Office of Recruitment. It's kind of a both question. So it's, I'm currently a junior at Cibola High School. For a while I had trouble deciding what career path to take. Currently I think I'm going to UNM and studying chemical engineering, getting my undergraduate after that. I thought I was going to New Mexico Tech to study explosives. Is this a good path or do you have any suggestions for me to follow? It's a um, good path. Yeah, I, so depending, I would highly suggest if you are interested in both schools, especially for your undergraduate deg degree, um, I would suggest going to each campus. We're very different. So New Mexico Tech is in a small rural campus. Um, so you really get that one-on-one -on -one attention with your professors. You'll pretty much know everyone on campus. Um, whereas if you go to UNM, you're at a much larger campus. Um, so it kind of just, it's kind of what you like. And I would highly suggest, like I said, to go visit, see which campus is the best fit for you, which one you like more. Um, sometimes the benefit of going to a smaller campus is that you can get um, into research as early as your freshman year at New Mexico Tech, whereas some other bigger universities, it's a little bit more competitive and harder to get into research. Um, and it's pretty much only exposed to, you're only exposed to research your junior and senior year at other bigger universities. So um, it's kind of just what you think and how you feel and what you think would be best for you. Um, and like you said, if you wanted to go to UNM and then go to New Mexico T Tech to get your master's, that's always a pathway. Or if you wanted to do vice versa, um, usually continuing your education will depend on what type of research that you want to work on or what you want to study. So um, at, here at New Mexico Tech, we do have pathways um, for pretty much all of our departments all the way to your doctoral degree. So um, like I said, it's just your choice, but come visit us and see if you like it. Just as a, as a bonus on that, um, at Emertech, we hire students all the time. And so we'll usually have between six and 12 undergrad students working here. And at any time you're working, I could hand you the keys to the vehicle, send you out in the field and say, okay, I need you to help set this up and we're shooting at two o'clock. So be out there and be ready. So it's, it's one of the ways that if, if you wanna try it, we hire. <laughs> I mean, that's a great answer. <laughs> so, um, another Yes, another question is, how much C4 is dangerous when you are put in a city situation? Did you any test based on this? Any amount. That's, I mean, as, even the smallest, um, uh, I have stuff in my office. This is a really, really, big piece of steel and this is uh, one pound of C4. And this is so heavy. Um, it destroys it. Um, the big thing about explosives and like being in a city is the pressure. Um, it doesn't take much to hurt people. Um, we're squishy bags of water. And so if it's close enough, that pressure wave goes through the body and it disrupts things. And so it does not take much. Um, so if it's a small amount in the middle of a city block, in the middle of the street where it's not gonna touch anybody, still damaging. You've also got the issue of flying glass. There's really not a safe amount. I mean, I suppose in the micrograms, but it's all pretty dangerous. So the next question was, what schools and degrees did you need in order to have this job? You absolutely have to have a bachelor's degree. 
a lot of our engineers um, have bachelor's degrees in mechanical or materials engineering. Since, since this job isn't about the research itself, I'm not coming up with the idea of, of the explosive. I'm helping the researchers make their ideas happen. So I don't have the, we're not the PhDs doing the research, but you either need like a bachelor's degree in mechanical or material, something that can help you figure out how to build the experiment and make it work. Um, some of them here have master's degrees in mechanical materials. Uh, we've got some chemical engineers with bachelor's degrees um, because we do, we also do very small testing um, on like, like I said, micrograms. That's one of the chemical engineers. So a bachelor's degree in any of the engineering I actually have my degree, my first, my bachelor's is in um, experimental psychology, how to design an experiment, which has helped me out a lot here is how to design an experiment. And then um, my master's was with impact studies. And so I, I really came at it a weird way, but um, most commonly it's a bachelor's in an engineering and then uh, possibly a master's. Sorry, my mute button wasn't working quite well. No worries. Do the bomb explosions, uh, strength, length of time and impact on the surroundings depend on the amount of atomic mineral material that you use when creating the testing bombs? I don't know if that's a loaded question. Yes. Yes. Um, oh, okay. I can. I can. Now I can read that. The bombs explosion strength and length of time. Yes. We well. We don't actually use atomic energy here because this is like you said. We are very protective of our environment here. We're very protective of. We have one person here. She is an environmental engineer. And her job is to make sure that what we're doing is not messing anything up. And if it does start to mess things up, she's got to help, help us fix it. Um, but yeah, so we don't do anything atomic. But it is that one of the big things is when a, a company says, okay, we want to set off you know, 500 pounds of ANFO. Okay, so now I need to think about, okay, where on the range can I put that? If I put it over here, the canyon walls are too steep. Um, and it's going to echo too much. Sometimes, especially in the winter, we have to watch the weather because if there's an inversion where there's warm air down here and super cold air up here, it echoes and it rolls through the town and it can set off car alarms, but we haven't done that in years. Um, so yeah, it is a huge thing that we have to think of. Um, luckily, most of that information has already been figured out. Uh, we look up tables to see, okay, they want us to use 500 pounds of ANFO. Um, so we look up what that's going to do. We can look up the peak pressure because it's, it's already all been figured out. And then we, it's already been uh, looked into as to what test sites can handle which peak pressures. So it's, it is work that has to be considered. And luckily that's already been considered a long time ago. And I just get to look at the tables and make sure I don't hurt anything. So the next question um, someone had, which kind of you had hinted at it, your environmental engineer on staff, is how does this impact environment around the test site? Um, one of the things it can do is it can change because we create so much debris. You saw from like all these explosions where we're just blasting through these concrete things. In the past, it was just like, okay, just push it off into that arroyo. Just push all the junk into the arroyo and don't worry about it. It's not toxic, it's just cement, don't worry about it. But then it starts to change the path of the water. So, um, and when we want to build another like big area or a company says, okay, we want, we want this really big gun here and we're gonna shoot this tank gun to see how, if our new tank armor is gonna help. Okay, we need to clear the pad some more and now we have to bury some cement to make sure it's gonna stabilize it. 
are we doing that in a way that's going to hurt the drainage? Are we doing it in a way that's going to hurt anything? Um, for a while, uh, a lot of places, the government wanted to test depleted uranium. And there is a small area out here that we can't go because there is radioactive depleted uranium. It's not leaching into the environment, but we just don't go there. So you have to consider, okay, when we've blown this thing up, if it, if it scatters stuff everywhere, is the stuff toxic? And if so, what are we gonna do to take care of that? Um, that's, a, that's a big part of our test plans actually, is if things go bad, what's the messiest, dirtiest, yuckiest thing that can happen? And what are you gonna do about it? So there's a lot, um, a lot of test plans is thinking, what if? Um, well, there's a rocket motor that wanted to, they wanted to test this rocket motor. And they said, okay, no worry. It's, it's only gonna, the, the flame of the rockets are gonna be going up. It's only gonna go down. Like, yeah, but what if the case blows up and it spreads material? Oh, no, no, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. It happened. And so it spread the material all over the place, but we had already planned for that. If it blows up, how far can it spread it? What is it gonna, is it gonna contaminate or how do we clean it up? So the whole idea of how are we gonna clean it up is a part of every single test we do, which makes a lot of paperwork, but it's better that way. Okay, so um, we have a few minutes left, so I'm trying to get to a couple more questions. Um, the next one is, how do you pay for this program? It depends. Um, most of what's getting the, honestly, the person that wants to blow things up the most is the U.S. government. And so the U.S. government says, hey, somebody, uh, we want a stronger set of armor. So some company will say, hey, I'll take some of that government money and we're going to develop this armor. And including in that is the testing for how we're going to test it. So through various companies, through, you know, Raytheon and through DET and through General Dynamics, they're all getting government money to make things blow up more or make things not hurt so much when they get blown up. And that's an oversimplification, but it's a good chunk of it. Um, but it comes through these little companies. Some of them are like three employees, you know, just really small uh, little companies that they've got an idea, they think they can make it work and they got government funding to make it happen. And so that, that eventually comes through us. Some of it is uh, research from the professors. So that's New Mexico Tech paying itself to do it. It's odd, but that's how it works. So yeah, that's most of it is uh, trickle down from the government eventually comes this way. But that's where all of my, my paycheck comes from, is from if a company wants to test something here, I have to go, okay, well, I think I, think I can do that test in about a week. So my pay for a week plus the field crew, but they're gonna have to set it up for two weeks before that. So I have to figure out, I have to imagine what this test is gonna take to do. And then I have to figure out, okay, how long is that gonna take everybody? And then I have a nice handy spreadsheet and we just start writing in, okay, uh, right in the test plan, that's gonna take me 20 hours. So I'll put that down. Um, getting that test site ready, that's gonna take three guys on the field crew, that's gonna take them three days. So three, it's nine, okay. And you just carry that out and you can give the, the customer this is how much we think it's going to cost. And we're usually pretty close in there. And they've usually gotten that money from the government. Not always, but usually. That's a long answer. <laughs> now that's perfect. Um, <laughs> and then um, the kind of in this last summation question, I'm going to merge a couple of them. So one was, what did you enjoy about what do you enjoy about your job? And then the last ones were like, what were your first impressions about this? Did you know you wanted to do this for the rest of your life? So like a, a summation. 
I, I do, I, I, um, let's see. My first impressions about this, I love the idea of someone having this, this concept of like, mm, I, I think, I think I made this thing and I think this thing is going to be good against explosions or you know, like the asteroid. Like, I think, I think we figured out how we can move it without destroying it, but we don't know. We got to test it. And so how, and I, I, I love the troubleshooting part of it. The sitting here and imagining my, the experiment going, okay, they want to shoot it at, they need, they need to hit this wall with this thing at 4,000 feet per second. Okay, I'm gonna need a gun and then I'm gonna to have to put something around it so it fits in the gun better. And then I'm gonna need, and, and just stepping through each part of this, going, well, okay, how, how am I gonna figure out how fast it went? I could use a camera or I could use two wire grids that it flies through and I take the time of each one and I know the distance. So I could do it that way or I could do it with the cameras or then I look at the budget and go, oh, I got enough money, I could do both. So I'll do both, make sure I'm doing it right. And so it's just, I like this idea of stepping through piece by piece and figuring out Am I doing this right? Is this working? Is it not? I don't know. Um, and I, I never thought I would do a job like this, but I love it. I just love it. And I love on a really bad day and I get to climb on top of a gun that's 20 feet long and then I get to blow stuff up. So that's, I like that part too just seeing the destruction and, but knowing that from that destruction, there's better armor, there are safer buildings, there are earthquakes on Venus that are getting measured because I could help. So I really like that part. Oh, how much do I get paid? Not enough, never enough. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I finally saw the chats now. Um, the salary actually, because it's tech, we're standard or the cost of living in, in, in Socorro is pretty low. So we're paid lower than standard wages for what we would do, but I live three minutes from work. It's a small town, it's easy. So the starting pay is about $50,000 a year. And then um, um, for the, senior members that have been here for 15 years that have a master's degree, they're getting up around 90 to 100,000. About that. So it's not bad. So, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> so you're able to see the chat, so that's good. But um, thank you so much um, for your time today. I do wanna make a housekeeping announcement that um, chat box, I have placed the link for the survey and the attendance link. So um, students, before you leave, make sure you click on the link, it'll open up a new window. Make sure you complete the survey and hit submit to ensure that you get credit for attending today's session. Um, any advisors on the line, we also are tracking attendance. If you want to put your information also, please do or just give general feedback. Um, but thank you all for coming today. Um, there's a couple little loose questions that I have a couple minutes to answer for that are left. Um, is there was one about when there's an explosion on the ground, will it back in the spot where it exploded? Um, I think that might be an easier one. Or there's one about a use. So we can answer those in a couple minutes. Those are maybe the last couple of questions that I see in the chat. What was that last? Something, if there's an explosion on the ground, will anything grow back or will it stay a black spot? Oh, yeah. oh, life always finds a way. There's, if you leave it long enough there, I mean, it's New Mexico, so it, uh, it doesn't get filled in with grass very quickly. But yeah, it, it, it's not really toxic. It doesn't contaminate the ground. Oh yeah, there's, 
we've been blowing stuff up here for 70 years and there's weeds everywhere. So it grows. One of the days I had to, um, we were having a, a test go off and there was this big horn sheep that was just right over the test site. And we're trying to yell at it and we're trying to shoo it away and it wouldn't move. And so first we have to do this like little debt check where it's like a little pop just to make sure everything's working. And I thought, okay, well, we'll do that and he'll go away. We did that and he didn't go away. I think he's deaf. I think all the animals out here have to be deaf from all the explosions, but they're okay. But I figured it was it was supposed to be, in, we we're testing a non-lethal uh, crowd control thing. So I figured if it was non-lethal, it wasn't gonna hurt the sheep and we tried to make him go away. Um, but he just stayed there for a good chunk of the test and just watched. Uh, I guess it's fine. But yeah, he eventually wandered off. So entertainment, it's his daily entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much, if the big horn sheep can like sit there and handle it, I, the plants have, they don't care. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all of your time and your answers. I don't know if, now that you can open your chat, if you want to go up and prove, and there was a lot of cues there in the chat. So uh, <laughs> we really appreciate your time and your expertise and, and just, uh, you know, informing us on this topic. Um, thank you so very much. Absolutely. And um, if anyone ever comes to tech, if they come to tech and we're hiring, we hire students. So come work here, come get out there and blow some stuff up too. Um, so and we definitely will be in touch next field trip. What if and when we get back out there. Yes. Yes. So for now, that is the end of our um, presentation. Um, I have put the link again a few times in the chat. Make sure you open it, make sure you can access it and then uh, make sure you complete it. But with that is the end of our session. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you.